Okay, so we are now broadcasting. And let me just check to see if Cynthia. Okay, so Cynthia is now unmuted. Hi, Thank Cynthia. You. Hi, how are you? I'm doing all right. Good. Are you able to see uh, that we have uh, Jane, Mary, uh, people are joining, Monica is here? I'm not able to see them, but I'm hearing them, I'm sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, I'm going to hang up on my other line. Yeah, because we're getting an echo. Hi, Anna Olivia. Okay. So, Stephanie, you're talking, but you muted yourself. So we couldn't. Hear I just said you have a quorum. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we do? One, two, yes. three. One, two, three, four. Five. Four, five. Oh, I'm just counting Monica twice. Never mind. Monica. No, no, I I sorry. <laughs> Okay, so well, five is the quorum, right? Yes, it's Monica twice. No, no, no. Oh, my I, 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 I hung up. Okay. Mary, Janine, Monica, Anna, Olivia, Cynthia. Five. Okay. Now I should only be once. You are just one, with the Bay Bridge in the background for some reason. That's what I missed. I'm sorry. Golden Gate Bridge. Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> nice. Okay, so please let me know when you would like me to begin roll call. Um, we haven't heard from Rick or uh, uh, Rick is, I'm assuming Rick is coming and uh, Ernie. They should be, um, Adrian, with their invites, did they respond to those? Yes, they did. I can. Okay, let's give it, uh, let's give it one more minute and then we'll get started since we have a quorum. Great. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah. All right. I like your background, Stephanie. Thank you. It's like is that your <laughs> is that like in the office? office. I have right, like I'm in the I'm in the office. <laughs> At the view from the EBC office? It's just yes. my favorite one, but it makes me look very strange sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's the best. There. How do you do that? Yeah, well, I, we're gonna look, get started, it looks like but... space is coming out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get it started. Uh, so, welcome to the Monday, April 20th uh, Community Advisory Committee meeting for EBCE. This is coming through a webinar. I'm going to turn it to Adrian uh, and or Stephanie briefly to talk about the webinar format, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, uh, so we are doing this in a webinar format where um, all of the, the panelists are um, unmuted, uh, but the attendees are muted. You need to uh, have filled out a speaker form um, a half hour prior to the meeting and uh, you can um, raise your hand if you um, have already filled out the speaker form um, and Stephanie will call on you during the public comment or um, during the, uh, 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 the question and answer period after uh, the agenda item. Um, with that, I can go to roll call. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Member Eldridge? Present. Uh, Member French? Present. Uh, Laundry? Present. O'Connell? Uh, excused. Uh, Pacheco? Excused. Um, Padilla? Present. Uh, Thomas uh, is excused. And uh, Chair Sutter? Present. Ah, we have a quorum. Um, and um, we go to public comment. Great, thank you. So as, as usual, this item is reserved for people who want to talk to us about anything that's not on our agenda. Um, I heard prior to this that we actually have no speaker slips for item C2. Is that still correct, Adrian? Um, 
Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to move on uh, to item C3, which is the approval of minutes um, from the February 18th uh, meeting. And do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any discussion? No. So hearing no discussion, I'm going to uh, assume that the uh, minutes are approved as written. Everybody in agreement? Say, yeah. I'm hearing nods. Yeah. Okay. Aye. Cynthia, any comments from you? Or yeah. do you agree to approve? Yes, I do. Okay. Minutes are approved. We're going to move on to item C4, which is uh, the chair report. I only have one item to bring up to everybody today, and that is um, I have been in contact with JP. As you know, um, one of the items in the COVID relief that EBCE is doing is putting another 300000 towards community grants. Um, that information and, and how they're getting that out there has not yet been fully fleshed out. But I wanted to let folks know that um, we will be asking for a CAC member uh, participation once they have um, this evaluation for the community grants ready to go. And, they, and we would be asking somebody to participate in that particular effort. I think this is what, Jane, you did previously. Mm -hmm. okay. So no funds but, have been dispersed yet. Is that correct? Correct. Right. They're busy getting the other money that they're putting out via COVID for the COVID-19 relief is what JP was telling me. So they are planning uh, to include us in this and uh, at the point that they are ready to start de de uh, evaluating the, um, the items that come in, we'll be, I'll be reaching out to you or JP will be reaching out to you to see if anybody's interested. Um, I think Rick is now on, at least I see him here, but he is muted. Uh, Rick, can you unmute yourself and let us know if you're here? I am here. Great. So let the record show that Rick is, is O'Connell is here. And we have a Vanessa Gerber. <laughs> is that you, Ernie? She's staff, so she may be presenting, so I just promoted her over. I staff. see. Okay, I didn't know who that was. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are moving on to item C5, which is the power content procurement floor item. This is an action item for us as the CAC in the sense that we, we want to hear from staff in terms of this particular item and uh, take back to the board on Wednesday a recommendation from or, or the CAC um, advice about um, accepting this proposal or not. I don't know who's speaking for staff. I see Todd is on and Nick is on and Vanessa is on. Who will be speaking towards this for us? I see Nick will. Okay. So are you going to be having the presentation showing, Adrian? Uh, yes. Showing your presentation? Okay. Great, thanks. Nick, go ahead and take it away if you're gonna be talking. You're still on mute. Uh, how about that? How about now, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to give a, 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 an overview and then I'm actually going to pass it to Vanessa, who uh, is the staff lead on this item to kind of walk through the, the specific slides. So can we go to the first slide, please? Can we advance the slides to Adrian? We're on slide Which, three now, Nick. I think you might be lagging. Do you want the first, you want slide two that has the overview? The overview slide, yes. Overview slide, yep. please. Okay. 
So we're now on the overview slide. Okay, great. <laughs> so I, I'm going to kind of give the overview and then I'll let Vanessa take it uh, from here. Um, so when EBC, prior to EBC launching, we set a power content um, at 85% carbon three. That 85% was um, uh, meant to achieve our goal of being cleaner than PG&E um, with some buffer. Um, and we have maintained that in 2018 and 2019. Um, as uh, the, the, the power procurement landscape uh, has changed, you know, both, you know, as it relates to PG&E's power content, but also the, 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 the way P power content compares to PG&E for CCA. Um, staff has been evaluating, you know, are there better ways to, um, care to characterize our power content relative to PG&E uh, and also achieved um, our goal of, uh, having the most cost effective uh, resource portfolio possible um, in light of these, these, the increasing PCIA that we're seeing and, and now the, um, the economic recession that uh, we're, we're not fully uh, able to quantify, but we know is going to um, have some fairly significant effects on the agency's finances. So with that in mind, um, and you know, really in the context of the allocation from um, PG&E, uh, staff is proposing that we transition away from a um, point of comparison where we look at EBC's total carbon-free content and compare that to kind of a forecast value for what PG&E's power content is going to be. And really instead focus on comparing ourselves uh, to PG&E on the basis of how much renewable energy we purchase versus how much uh, P renewable energy is forecast to be in PG&E's mix. Um, you know, I think the, part of the, the rationale here is that by focusing on being uh, more renewable than PG&E, uh, we, we, we're not only beating them on the source of clean energy that you know, is most important, which is renewables, because those are the things that we're procuring and we're buying more of. But we're, we're also positioning ourselves to be, re, you know, to kind of move up and down as allocations move up and down. So to the degree that we accept the uh, hydro allocation or the nuclear allocation, um, we would have, you know, expected parity in our the quantity of large hydro we have and PG&E has if we accept hydro and this, the quantity of nuclear, if we accept between our, our portfolio and PG's portfolio, if, if we accept the nuclear. And so in that way, um, our total carbon content should be roughly, you know, 5% higher than PG&E's in any given year, while our renewables are 5% um, by mandate higher than, than PG&E's. So that's the, that's the staff proposal. Um, you know, I think it has, this has the added effect of achieving um, for, you know, forecast calendar year, you know, in excess of $11 million of procurement savings. So Vanessa, um, why don't you take over? Thanks. Um, Adrian, if we can go to the next slide, please. I'll just walk through, you know, how we, um, you know, what the baseline is for, for this comparison. Um, so this is, you know, the current policy, as, as Nick highlighted, the bright choice power um, is RPS compliance plus 5%. So for 2020, that's um, 33 plus 5 is 38%, um, as well as the remainder of an 85% product portfolio uh, being carbon free. So large hydro ACS. Um, this proposed policy, um, as Nick highlighted, would be the forecast for PG&E plus 5%, and that 5% is a buffer, best, you know, good faith effort to be cleaner than, more, well, more renewable than PG&E um, with the, the, the carbon free from the allocation, um, depending on what that decision is, tracking with PG&E, all in the logic of more renewable, same carbon free equals cleaner than PG&E. Um, so being able to, to still move for, you know, pr provide our, our value proposition there. Um, of course, it's challenging to forecast um, PG&E's load. Um, 
and they file um, pretty much every, not necessarily every July, but uh, last year was July. It's typically kind of in the anywhere from kind of May to August time frame of renewables um, uh, bundled RPS energy sales solicitation where they have the, four, the actuals up until the year prior and then forecast for the year of the report uh, out about 15 years. Um, so the last report was July of 2019. Much of 2020 forward is redacted as is common. Um, and so we use that last latest full um, year of, of uh, actuals from pg e as our proxy for, for the, the following year. So in 2019, um, it was 34.5%, so plus 5% for 2020 for EBCEs, Bright Choice Renewables, 39.5. So that's, um, that's the, the renewables comparison uh, policy where no incremental uh, carbon free would be purchased by EBC, it would only be received through uh, the decided allocation by the board. Um, and of course, you know, given the context of budget, we would always be seeking to, to have a higher carbon-free content. Uh, that would be in the context of budget and board direction. And this floor applies only to Bright Choice. There'd be no power content changes for uh, Brilliant 100 or Renewable 100. Adrian, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so for Bright Choice, this would mean uh, procurement savings of a little over a million dollars, um, and that is a direct translation of the carbon-free energy that um, EBC would not be purchasing in the market um, as we would only be purchasing renewables for Bright Choice with the remainder of carbon-free coming from the allocation decision. Um, of course, this would still be, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Well, Vanessa, I thought you said a million, but I'm seeing 11. Maybe yeah, I misheard. 11 million. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. and that'll be, that'll be, repeated in, in the slides uh, to come with the, with the different yeah, yeah. scenarios. Yeah, uh, a lot, quite, quite significant. Um, so, you know, this is still in compliance with RPS. Uh, it, it's likely to actually be uh, more renewable than, um, than the current policy. The only way in which it would ever be the same as the current policy is if pg e is, is projected to have exactly RPS compliance. Um, which is probably not going to be the case. Um, so this will likely result in a higher renewable content for Bright Choice. Um, and, but it is possible that, you know, this 5% buffer could result in a year in which, you know, the proxy forecast that we use for, for pg e is not what they actually ended up, uh, you know, having on their power content label, but there is a reporting lag. So that's why we, we think that a 5% buffer is, uh, is a good, good buffer um, for for this to to very likely you know stay ahead of, of PG&E, um, and then for carbon free for Bright Choice, um, Bright Choice will get its EBCE share of whatever allocation uh, is approved by the board, and therefore that should track with um, with PG&E as well. And so um, the Bright Choice carbon free percentage will decrease for these years as will be outlined in the in the following slides um, but if but comparing ourselves to pg e on a like for like resource basis again that's renewables plus whatever accepted um, carbon free allocations we receive we should remain cleaner than pg e so move to the next slide please hopefully you'll get more specific uh, so the next this we have this highlight slide and then uh, we'll go through the the next three kind of have a bit of an anecdote for what the different uh, scenarios mean and what and how we kind of arrive at those numbers. But just want to highlight uh, the the notes here. Again, this first star on the PG&E renewables. That's just referencing where we sourced that from, um, and that's the baseline there uh, for adding five percent buffer. That's how we get to thirty nine point five percent in that second column for EBCE's renewables under the new guidelines. Um, and then the two stars, they're referencing pg e allocations. Um, we arrived at those numbers um, from taking an average of pg e large hydro and nuclear percentages on their power content labels from 2013 to 2017, 
has a solid five-year average of pre-CCA kind of large load departure uh, as a, a uh, you know, an estimate of what their uh, large hydronuclear power content percentages will likely return to uh, after the application process. Because it's a pro rata share, they should be retaining about the same that they had prior to uh, CCAs on a percentage basis. And then just do want to highlight that these, this is representative of, you know, an illustrative full year. Um, so these percentages to, um, are, are based on a full year. So if we can go to the next slide, I think it'll be helpful to, to kind of specifically highlight what each of these are. So we'll go through the, the three slides and then um, that'll be the kind of the, the, the presentation here. So this is the new, the new guideline scenario, um, which just shows the renewables um, percentage being 5% higher than the forecast PG&E. And then the, the um, pardon me, <clears throat> the carbon-free percentages tracking with PG&E. And so, as you can see, um, with the carbon-free total percentages, either with or without nuclear, um, this decision is ultimately, um, you know, it results in the same savings because PG, or pardon me, EBC will only uh, have carbon-free from the PG&E allocations um, and will not be purchasing that. So that's where those savings come from. It's the amount um, that we otherwise would be spending to, to um, achieve 85%, uh, minus a little bit more that we're spending for a little bit more renewable. Uh, but you'll see that for the same savings for right choice, uh, there's a potential, potentially large difference in carbon-free, but that is, um, should this policy be approved by the board, um, is, is ultimately you know, the decision for the allocation there. Uh, and so if we move to the next, kind of go to the next uh, scenario here. Um, if the board does not approve um, this policy and rather maintains the 85% carbon free uh, target for bright choice, um, there could still be uh, about $8.6 million in savings for bright choice procurement um, if the nuclear is accepted. Uh, meaning we'd, you know, we'd still have to purchase 12.9% of the Bright Choice product portfolio in additional large hydro, um, which is uh, would, would result in, in less savings. But that's the difference here. And then if we go to the next slide, please. That's just the final scenario, um, maintaining 85%, though this policy is not approved, um, and only hydro is accepted. Um, we basically, whatever the hydro volume is, would have to purchase that same volume in large hydro in the market, resulting in, in fewer savings. So then the next slide is just uh, kind of how we got to those numbers for reference. Hopefully um, you have that as well um, from the agenda packet. Um, that is, that's the, uh, the summation of, of this item. Uh, open to, to questions uh, or just back to you, Mary, for, for committee discussion. Um, I would like to put this out to the public first before the committee dis uh, discusses. I've heard that we actually have uh, a couple um, folks who have put in to talk about this. Adrian? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> We have a hand up from Barbara Stebbins. Allow her to talk. Great, thank you, Barbara. She still looks like she's muted from here. Hold on one second. not unmuting. If she's on, on the second. phone, if she's on the phone, she should try star six. I don't know if she is. I can't see that. I'm trying to unmute her. Hold on a second.
Barbara, if you can uh, hear us and uh, if you can yeah, hit start not. six. No, not working. If you're on the phone, I don't know if you're on the phone or on your computer, Barbara. On your computer and your laptop itself is unmuted. You might have to scroll over the top of the actual Zoom bar and unmute that, which will you will be entered in as a default mute. So you will actually have to move your cursor across your screen to unmute um, the microphone on the Zoom call itself. I temporarily added her as a panelist so she can speak and then I'll demote her back down uh, after she's done speaking. Maybe that'll help. Okay, I don't see her as a panelist quite yet. Yeah. She's still looking like she's off there. Well, we Hi, Barbara, we should be able to hear you. Barbara? Mm -hmm. I actually don't see a little... Uh, don't see microphone or phone. I don't see anything. Yeah. Well, we tried to troubleshoot uh, her. Did we go to Al or Audrey? They also have speaker cards. Yeah. Um, but Barbara, we're going to try and come back to you. So, uh, Al, I, I think you have been unmuted. I think so. Mm -hmm. It's really tough to figure this out because I couldn't even find out how to unmute. So I imagine Barbara's got the same uh, the same kind of problem. Anyway, uh, well, we were supposed to be able to unmute you. So that it was supposed to be on us to be able to unmute you. But uh, we're still yeah, working on that. So please, yeah, the little, please talk, the little, Al. The little icon, the little icon where you can mute or unmute didn't show, I guess, until maybe you call on us. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I don't know. Go what for happened. It, Al. Oh, now, I, now all I have is a big screen that says how much time I have to say a few things. <laughs> uh, That's it. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't know what to say about this. We, uh, we just got this a couple days ago. Uh, that chart with uh, all the columns and whatnot is about as indecipherable as anything I've seen before. What I hear from it mostly is that it's, it all presumes, uh, you know, this uh, allocation, this, this uh, carbon-free uh, allocation uh, uh, to, to buy this energy from pg and &E at reduced price and whatnot, and it's extremely convoluted. Uh, it's unclear to me what the urgency is of this issue. Uh, we have, uh, you know, as uh, folks in the East Bay Clean Power Alliance always said that the purpose of East Bay Community Energy is not only more renewables, but local renewables. And uh, so in terms of a policy change, I, I don't know. It means that, it means that, uh, uh, that the current policy isn't about more renewables, but the whole program was founded on the basis, you know, of more local renewables, real local renewables. Uh, I can't understand really what's, what's being put forward here and all the cost estimates, uh, where they come from, exactly how they're calculated, what assumptions are being made about the market. Uh, I think it's extremely uh, convoluted and, and unclear uh, what the major thrust is. Yes, we should do better on renewables and PG&E, but this is all getting integrated with this uh, whole uh, PG&E allotment issue, the advice letter, the nuclear, uh, the large hydro, uh, all things that haven't even been decided upon yet at all. So it really looks like some kind of a, a way of trying to push the, uh, to push the nuclear, uh, buying nuclear from PG&E under the cover of more renewables. And, you know, I really think that's pretty uh, objectionable. And the first thing to do logically, you know, would be to decide what the policy of East Bay Community Energy is around this uh, purchase of carbon-free content from PG&E. And then based on that, to come back to this question. Uh, I think the reasonable thing to do is to 
to advocate that this not be a decision, uh, a, a, a decision at the board meeting. Uh, nobody knows what it's about uh, and why it's such an important thing to do right now. And it's so dependent on the whole uh, acceptance of pg es offer under the advice letter that I really think uh, it needs to be postponed until we have clarity about uh, the other issue that's actually after this in the agenda. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm out of time. Thank you, Al. Mary, we can't hear you now. Yes, sorry. I put myself on mute because I was typing. Um, Barbara um, got kicked off. I heard she's back. Barbara, can you hear us and can you say anything? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Please yes. go. Great. Okay. Uh, so I think Al was explaining that while we support the concept of a focus on renewables because they are the only long-term sustainable resources and because they're the only ones that can be developed locally. We have many objections to this uh, proposal being put forth here. Uh, I'll point out, I'll try and point out things different from what Al said. For instance, that uh, Bright Choice is the most popular uh, choice amongst EBCE customers and to make a major policy decision when the public has had almost no notice because all the notice we had was as of Friday that this was going to come out and in fact spent quite a bit of time over the weekend trying to understand what it was all about because it's quite <coughs> um, We think this represents a major policy shift and should not be made that decision should not be made during a pandemic with very limited public participation and ability to even know that this is happening. Um, it also is clear that this is all falling on Bright Choice. Bright Choice is the lowest price. That means it basically is the one that is going to be the only choice for low income people. And what it will mean ultimately is a dirtier mix for low income people. So it's very discriminatory. We can say very discriminatory. Um, we, uh, the 11.3 million is clearly misleading. That's for a whole year. We don't have a whole year. We would have a half year. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's see. We do, and one of the real problems is there's no budgetary context for why these are the choices being offered. There are clearly other choices. We need to know kind of what's the trade-off between renewables and carbon-free. How much is it that we pay extra for carbon-free? How much is it that we pay for renewables? We need to understand those things. Um, uh, oh, the other thing to realize is that PG&E may be able to become more renewable if they have less nuclear that they have to deal with right now they are limited in the amount of renewable they can take because they take the nuclear because nobody else wants it so they would be as of this year they will probably be at 61.9 percent nuclear unless all of the ccas wind up taking nuclear off their hands so that's a big problem too so those are the main problems that i wanted to raise on this issue i hope that this group will decide not to support this proposal or at least to say it needs more discussion. It needs to be a discussion item first and then go to a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Do we have any other speakers on this? Oh. Yes. I, I, bit, 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 bit. You, uh, I, I think you you had unmuted Audrey. Do we have Audrey as a speaker yes. on this as well? Can you? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Okay. Thank you, Audrey. Okay, great. Um, I, there's not that much uh, to add uh, from uh, to Al and Barbara's statement. Um, my basic uh, question was, which I sent in as a message, was um, why do we have to have this very formal? Um, 
uh, 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 floor established. Um, what strikes me is that for Bright Choice, nuclear is being introduced where it didn't exist before. And um, uh, all of this is, uh, strikes me, uh, it strikes me that, uh, that uh, staff wants to make this introduction of nuclear more pal palatable to the many people who object uh, to nuclear in our power mix. Um, so it's like a diversionary tactic. Um, uh, but that's what it seems to be on, at, at first blush. Um, so I support very much, um, much more discussion about this issue and uh, really focusing on the merits of whether to accept the nuclear allotment um, before uh, you know anything else is done. I think this, the staff statement was that this is independent of whether we accept the allotment or not, but obviously uh, they, they go hand in hand. We, that issue is, uh, overshadows this. Um, so that's my two cents. Uh, I would like uh, more discussion and uh, uh, lengthier, uh, fuller discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you, Audrey. Uh, Adrian, Stephanie, do we have any other speakers? Hearing none, I'm going to open it oh, up I, to... Pardon me, I'm looking through. Um, we have Jessica, and then I see one hand. Mark, if you can hear us, can you please complete the speaker form so that we can call on you? He has his hand raised, but has not completed the speaker form. But I can unmute Jessica now. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, this is Jessica here. Hi, everyone. Hi. I just want to, uh, in very short and sweet, I do not like the idea of, of creating this dynamic of kind of sticking it to the lowest product, the default product of Bright Choice. Um, first of all, we should not be considering nuclear. We haven't even determined yet if that's what we are doing. Clearly, there's a lot of opposition to it. So to have this discussion is premature, um, but it is very insulting to say that you would add nuclear energy only to the mix of the most affordable product that EBCE offers. It's insult to injury. As an environmental justice organizer and person who's been impacted by dirty energy, you are literally uh, perpetuating the same discrimination that created this, these dynamics in our system. East Bay Community Energy should not be, should not be participating in that. Right. Clean energy should be accessible to everyone in a way that is equitable. This is not at all equity in our community. And this is absolutely gross. So that's all I want to say. And I want to echo what Barbara, Al, and Audrey have said. Thank you, Jessica. We have a Mark, perhaps? Stephanie, how easy is it for somebody to actually fill this thing out on the fly? Very easy. There it goes. He just okay. filled it out. So we have. I hope I'm on. Yes. Very so ready. Okay. And you're ready, Mark. Go for it. Thank you very much. I'm a neophyte to this whole thing. I don't understand. Uh, but, but notice how you guys are handing out some money, which caused me then to scratch my head and say, why am I here? I, I looked at the, the slide number five, and it talked about carbon-free percentage without nuclear, and it shows 85% if you do nothing, which drops down to 50.3% if you change. I thought we all wanted to get to 100% carbon-free as quickly as possible, so I don't understand why you're dropping this. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit about $8.5 million for whatever the timeline is, and my second question is, is you're saving some money. Where's the money savings go? So 
two questions. Why, why drop down 35% uh, in, in the carbon-free uh, portfolio? And then uh, why, what goes with the money that you're going to be saving out of this thing? And, and if that can be answered tonight, if not, then, then perhaps it can be answered on Wednesday night. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I would like, to, if we have no other public, you're hearing no, none, I'm going to open it up to um, the CAC. And folks on the CAC, um, Adrian, can you make it so, yeah, so I can see the participants again. I can do it from here. I would like us to raise raise your hand, except for Obviously, Cynthia, you're on the phone. You can hit star nine to raise your hand, or you can just kind of break in <laughs> at any point okay. if you want to say you. something. Um, but I would like to hear from, from the CAC. We are, I would like to be able to provide some sort of uh, advice back to the board on Wednesday. Okay, Monica. I can see you visually, so that'll work. Go ahead and unmute oh, yourself. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand virtually. I don't have a raise it's my hand. It's down on the bottom. bottom. You have to see participants. You open up participants, and then it's down at the bottom right. It says raise hand. But that's okay. I saw you. So it'll be Monica and then Anne Olivia. Oh, I still don't see that. Huh. Yep. Don't have it. Um, well, okay. So I had a few questions um, for staff. Just first, just to clarify, this is only for 2020, is that correct? Um, the- Would you like us to answer the questions? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Nick, go, go for it. Uh, so th this is for 2020. Uh, and uh, I think as Vanessa noted, this is a floor for procurement. So, you know, thereafter, you know, in 2021 and beyond um, at board direction uh, and, you know, based on the financial circumstances, you know, we would seek to procure above this, uh, these levels. But so, uh, you know, if, in principle, this could continue uh, into the future as well. Okay. And then the second was a clarification. I think somebody else raised it as well. Maybe it was Barb. The $11.3 million that you estimate in savings is basically the avoided purchases that you would make for large hydro. Are those $11.3 million for all of 2020 or just until if you were to get the allocation or allocations through the end of the calendar year? So what time period does that 11.3 million cover? It covers a calendar, it, it covers a calendar year or in our case, it, so we looked at it over the course of a fiscal year. Okay, so what is your fiscal year again? That, that ends in? July to June. July to June. So it's a 12 month savings regardless. Yes. Okay. And then I had the similar question as well. Um, if you were to, if this got approved by the board and I guess depending on what they, what is decided in terms of taking the nuclear or not taking the nuclear, what would, how would these, where would the savings be directed? What would you do with the money? So at, at our at our last regular meeting, so not our March meeting, but our February meeting, uh, and then in our January meeting, for a number of meetings now, I would say, uh, we've been highlighting the uh, expected deficit that we are um, we are forecasting as a result of the increase in the PCIA. Uh, our la at our last presentation on this, we were uh, forecasting a deficit, you know, in the thirty million dollar range. Uh, and that's a deficit of, you know, thirty million dollars less uh, revenue than, or our revenues would be thirty million dollars less than our expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so these cost savings would go towards um, bridging the gap to, you know, ensure that we don't, um, or, or to reduce our deficit. So reduce the deficit and avoid possibly losing the value proposition against PG&E as well. So it would be, it would, you know, offset the need to change the value proposition. It would offset the need to draw from reserves that were, um, you know, building to move towards a credit rating. 
um, and, and, and hopefully position ourselves to be able to um, operate at as close to cost parity as possible. Okay. Yeah. Those are my only questions for now, Mary. Great. Thank you, Monica. And Olivia? Thank you so much. I really do appreciate a uh, staff's report on this. I, I'm i seeing kind of two different issues that are being presented together. And so for clarity, I'm going to kind of pull them out. Uh, if I'm misunderstanding them, please correct me. Uh, the first one is uh, looking at a comparison style. So are we comparing um, greenhouse gas uh, free or carbon free? I guess, um, energy, or are we comparing renewables? Um, that seems like one issue. And the other one is whether or not, assuming that the allocation is made, because this presentation assumes the allocation is accepted, um, that, that whether or not to put that all in right choice. So I'm just going to kind of separate those two real quick, because there's different things on those things. So looking first at the comparison style, uh, I really would like to support staff in saying that um, comparing renewables is a really good idea. Um, and as was mentioned in the past, uh, definitely highlighting um, greenhouse gas free, uh, if we don't accept the allocation um, and calling out which part of theirs is nuclear and which is the rest of it, because I do believe that will make a difference. Um, in how that is viewed on our content label. Um, also, uh, I also have reviewed the reports from 2008 through uh, December 31st, 2019, but I went through the 10Ks to look at um, a whole variety of things. And um, it's possible that staff should at least look at whether it would also be useful in the comparison of renewables to look at not just um, their percentage, but the actual kilowatt hour production and its change over time, because their peak was in 2016. And since then, their renewable production has dropped from well over 22,000 to now around 10 and a half thousand a year. So that is a really substantial drop in their renewable production. Um, and so that might be another way to help highlight the real changes that we're making, especially if it's over time because ours will be increasing. Whereas even if their percentage increases, their actual energy uh, of renewable energy is decreasing. Um, then to just move into the other one around, uh, well, actually, sorry, I had, I had clarifications on the first one. Um, Vanessa, thank you so much for being here and for that presentation. I. Um, I'm hoping that we can get a little bit of clarity. Just to follow up on um, Monica's statement, uh, Nick, you said it's 12 months, calendar year, fiscal year, July to June. Which 12 month period is that 11 million for? We looked at it in the context of our fiscal year. So uh -huh. July to June, so July of 2020 to June of 2021. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that does address a pretty big concern. And then if we look at, uh, if we go back to slide, um, well, slides five through eight, any one of them would work just fine. Is there a way to pull that up again, please? Just a moment. I'll take those back. Oh, thanks. on slide five. Thank you. And, and I'm correct in that five to eight were the same, just highlighting different boxes, right? That's correct. Okay, great. Um, so uh, there were a couple things here. Um, Vanessa, you said that you had got, you'd reached these numbers by evaluating the average between uh, 20, 
something in 2017, 2013 to 2017, something like that. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's in, in Appendix A, which is the final slide, just to highlight that math. Right. Yep. So I, I'm curious why that would be taken as an assumption for return to normal. Like if you look at the, so 2016 was when the, um, when CCA started entering, when the plan for Diablo to go offline um, happened, when that decision was uh, was issued, and when all that started taking effect. And so if you look at the percentage uh, makeup of PG&E's energy, it, since then, it has, it, it isn't following that prior five-year span at all. And um, in fact, the, their procurement this year was at 100 or 2019 through, according to their reports, um, the reporting was, uh, they were at 145% or a little bit more than that procurement for the year. And um, I, I just don't remember, I'd have to look up their uh, 10K again, but um, the percentage makeup, like they've gotten rid of all of their natural gas, uh, they've cut the renewables by half. That's ex expected to go down farther this year. Um, why would the assumption be made that through 2025 that it would go back to how it was before? I just don't understand that. Yeah, I'm, the the logic there is that, I mean, sure, any one year, um, you know, in, in our production, with particularly with renewables, it's really hard to take one year and say that's indicative. So we wanted to take an average of the five years preceding a large load departure for CCAs to say this is what PG&E's mix, including their large uh, generating assets, including nuclear and large hydro, um, to get a percentage of what, what that breakdown is likely to return to. Not to say that it's specifically going to be, you know, to the to the tenth percentage here, um, but a, a proxy of of what PG&E's relative resource is on the power content. Uh, should the allocations be dispersed to all the CCAs, um, that their pro rata share should return to what it was when so, all of those CCA customers were PGE customers. So this that assumption that they will return to those numbers is based on CCAs taking because the pro rata share is just going to be split up between the CCAs that take it potentially, because that offer still hasn't been made, so we're not actually clear what that'll look like yet. Um, but that is the assumption that either enough of them take it, or one per, or one agency gets dumped with all of it, and they're able to go back to the percentages that was before. I, I would be happy to share with you the graphs that I've made, uh, looking at that uh, period over a 10 year span, which was what was requested of me um, by staff at the last meeting, uh, or in February. Um, and so I have completed that analysis and would be happy to share that with you because my numbers and all of the people that I've spoken with do not share that base assumption that that percentage would go back unless in fact PG&E could get rid of all of their nuclear and not. That's, that's I, I don't, this, this is, um, Hmm. Uh, I, l l l let me maybe just interject in terms of, you know, how we got to the 10.8 and the 23.3. So what we were trying to get was what is the expected annual output on an, you know, average. So we, we took a five-year average and because we, we took the five-year period before significant load departure. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a sense of if you were to allocate hydro over a five-year period, you allocate PG were to allocate all of its hydro to all of the CCAs on a pro rata basis. We should end we should end up all having 10.8 percent of our mixed hydro. PG&E's mix will be 10.8 percent hydro, and the CCAs mix will be 10.8 percent hydro. Similar to nuclear, it's predicated on everyone accepting the allocation. Uh, obviously, we, we we don't know exactly who if EBCE will accept the allocation. We do know some CCAs have accepted it, and some CCAs have not accepted it. Um, so th this is based on a set of assumptions just to give sort of an apples to apples comparison of what our power content would look like relative to uh, PG&E's under this allocation scenario where we're focusing on renewables and then we're sort of uh, assuming in general that 
our large hydro will be the same as their large hydro. And so, so far, we know, we know of no CCA that has not accepted the large hydro allocation. So we feel like that's, um, you know, a, 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 a fairly accurate assessment of how things are going to go. For nuclear, there are some CCAs that have not accepted the allocation. So, you know, maybe these values will be slightly different, but not knowing that, we're trying to create sort of as straightforward analysis as possible. Thank you for that. I, I, um, I would be interested in taking a closer look at that math after this meeting. We don't need to take up any more time here from it, but especially since we don't know what that is yet, the um, five-year base period, I'm, I'm having a little bit of issue with. Um, and then if you could go forward in the slides until um, it shows uh, probably this one. Well, the, the question, so um, the idea around the savings uh, was presented um, like it's, it's highest if you put all of the nuclear energy in bright choice um, because we don't have to procure energy then. Um, and we don't have to procure uh, carbon free energy because we can just use the allocation for our label. Where is the actual energy? So I, I think one, one thing energy. is that we're, we're not uh, we're, we're not assuming that the allocation of nuclear only goes to bright choice or the allocation of hydro only goes to bright choice. The, the allocations uh, flow through uh, to bright choice and brilliant 100 on a you know, percentage of load basis. So 15% of the load is brilliant 100. They sure. get an allocation of 15%. So I, I just want to clarify that because there was a statement made that all the nuclear and all the large hydro allocations were going just to bright choice. That's not the case. It's they, they should have the same ratios. But yeah, but I mean, only because we can't separate molecules, but um, but you could market it so that don't you worry if you don't want nuclear, you can still get. Certainly, you, cer cer certainly you could, but that's not what we're saying. That staff is not proposing that. Right. Which is not actually the question I asked. The question I asked is where is the energy? Okay. Where does Where does that energy, because you still have to get the energy. Where does the energy like, come where does, from? Where from is that the coming nuclear? from? Nuclear. Well, because because we've been told repeatedly that we're not getting nuclear energy. We're just adding this thing to the power content label. So where what energy? Where is that energy coming from? I mean, physically, we take energy. For, you know, the, the way it works is all energy is liquidated into the Kaiso market. And associated with the liquidation of the market are tags to the degree that it's a renewable or large hydro or nuclear. And then uh, when you take power out, um, you know, you would take the tag with it. So it's, you're, we're taking, it's being liquidated into the CAISO and the tag is being delivered to the EBC. We're, there's not a physical nuclear being, you know, sort of directed to EBC. All energy sinks in the central market. So we are taking, okay. Um, and the final clarification um, is uh, just as a follow up to that. So if, if instead of applying this to the carbon free um, energy that we already have, uh, and we applied it to say some of the brown power, um, would, would we still be saving money here or would that become neutral? Like could we, we use it to money displace in natural gas? Yeah. We would be, to the degree that you are incrementally buying more on top of the allocation, then you are taking less natural gas. And if you are not taking the allocation and you are not buying, uh, you know, carbon free, then you, you're taking more natural gas. And th that's the point that, you know, your mix gets cleaner or dirtier based on how much of the allocation that you take. Yeah, the, the, uh, sorry, let me clarify the question. So if instead of using the uh, nuclear or large hydro to displace carbon free, resources that we're already purchasing, could we use it to 
displace natural gas resources uh, that we're using um, and still achieve cost savings, uh, even if it were less? Yes, we, 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 you, you would have less cost savings if you were to use the allocation for um, to displace natural gas. So above 85%, you would have, you, you, well, in, in one way, if you're not displacing a purchase, there are no cost savings. So using the allocation to go from 85 to 90 or 95 or 100%, there are no cost savings. It's just reduction in your power content label. The cost savings come from displacement of a purchase. Okay, up and coming. Okay. All right. Um, it, it feels very strange to have this agenda item, this part of it, happen prior to the other agenda item where we're talking about whether or not to take it because the second part of this item is really talking about what do we do with it when we take it. And so I, I guess I, I would like to separate these two and say I really support staff's uh, concept of uh, really highlighting the comparison of renewables, um, again, sending the, the recommendation to at least take a look and see if that percentage change over time or the actual kilowatt hours produced change is also a helpful figure to put forward because I think that could highlight the really good work that we're doing here and to separate out whether or not to put it in bright choice, um, not only prior to the uh, decision of even making it being accepted, holding that discussion first feels a little leading, um, but also uh, as this is an item that has been discussed at a previous board meeting and in that board meeting, it was felt that that was not a good avenue to examine because of the equity issues, as well as I believe the, um, gosh, I would have to review that, uh, that meeting, but I believe there was some question of legal implication of our mandate for equal service to all rate classes. Um, like that, as that question came up, uh, staff did not pursue that direction. So having this be properly, um, noticed and discussed and all those kinds of things as a separate issue uh, would would feel a lot better, but I do, uh, and for so many reasons, but I do uh, support the concept, that first part of comparing by renewables and and really would like that second part removed. That's, that's the end of my questions. Okay, so um, we have, you know, we, we have another contentious item that, are, that is still on the agenda, but I would like to hear from any of the other CAC, uh, Rick or uh, Cynthia um, or Jane. I, I can go next if um, Thank if you. That's, yeah, yes. go for okay. it. Okay. So uh, my comments will not be as uh, um, lengthy. Um, so I am um, well, first of all, um, I don't know if, if I have any authority to say this, Mary, but I am going to say it. Um, I would prefer that this be an inf informational item and not an um, action item. Um, I don't, but um, I, I think this item needs more uh, dis discussion uh, in light of the, uh, you know, pandemic. And I know that this probably has been referenced before. But it appears through the uh, through ev everyone's comments, um, including the public, that more uh, discussion uh, on this item um, needs needs to be had. Um, secondly, um, I am not in favor of the uh, change in the power content uh, procurement floor. Uh, I would like to see um, at this at this juncture uh, bright choice uh, to remain at uh, 85 percent uh, carbon free, and um, I still remain uh, opposed uh, to the inclusion of nuclear energy uh, in both um, uh, bright choice. Um, and, and and any other uh, 
allocation in brilliant 100 i i um i i i uh philosophically i think the inclusion of um nuclear energy in all due respect uh goes against the vision and uh principles of um community choice um and those Cynthia? are my Yes. Thank you. Can I ask you a clarifying question? Sure. You had indicated that you prefer this to be an informational item and not an action item. Is that for the Wednesday board meeting, you would prefer that the board not take action on them, that you would prefer that the board just discussed it? Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Jane or Rick? There we go. I can go next. Um, I have a question about this 11.3 million, and I'm wondering what is the percentage, what percentage does that represent of the overall procurement spend? Yeah, so uh, from, our, from our overall procurement spend, I think uh, in, in our February meeting, we referenced a $30 million deficit, so an overall procurement spend of um, uh, and, and these numbers are being uh, refined further as we go into the context of our budget setting, but an overall procurement spend of $390 million of that uh, roughly $360 million are energy procurement spend. So this would be a roughly 3% reduction in your energy procurement cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if, well, two questions then. Um, where, like, assuming that that we take the allocation and we, you know, we we realize this 11.3 million in savings, where would the other 20 million come from for that deficit? So, so, so I think w w one thing, just to your point about taking the allocation, if we accept, if we have, if the board were to uh, approve the. Um, updates to the power content guidelines. Um, the savings accrue to the agency irrespective of whether or not the agency accepts the allocation. So the, because we're comparing ourselves on the basis of renewables, so PG&E's forecast is 34.5, then our goal would be 39.5. We would procure 39.5% renewables. We would not go and incrementally procure any addition, any large hydro. The large hydro and to the degree that we accept the nuclear allocation in our mix would come from the allocation. So our power content would be a reflection of renewables that we buy and anything we accept in the allocation. And that would be our point of comparison to PG. And so that's the, that, that's the, this, the, the, the comparison is we compare ourselves on renewables and it, we compare ourselves on renewables uh, to PG&E, and then our total power content is a function of our renewables purchases plus the allocation. If you mm -hmm. accept the large hydro and the nuclear allocation plus the renewables that we buy, our expectation is that would leave us 5% cleaner than PG&E. If you do not accept uh, the nuclear, then um, you know you're if you're and you're comparing yourself to a PG&E that includes nuclear, then you're not going to have uh, the same level of carbon free. Um, but if you compare yourself to PG&E just on the basis of their renewables and large hydro, then, you know, you're still cleaner because. Uh, hey, Nick, there's... this is Mary. I, I want to interrupt for a second, mainly because I think Jane asked, where would the remaining 20 million come up from? The right. So I, I wanted to, so, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, but I, I get that. So I was going to get, I was going to get to that point, but I just wanted okay. to clarify that. Where is the additional 20 million come from? So, uh, you know, yeah. the additional 20 million comes in part from, um, other budget cuts that we're considering. So those are cuts to uh, overhead, reduced hiring, reduced reductions or slowing in future hiring, uh, reduced expense, you know, overhead expense, looking at, you know, our program's budget, are there reduced reductions that we have to pursue there? Um, and, and to the maximum degree, we're getting our cuts as far as we can get them and then uh, trying to make up any difference in um, 
looking at our discount, is there any modification to our value proposition that has to be made? And then any anything that's left in the deficit would have to be funded out of reserves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any the, other questions? Yeah, um, on the third um, column, the status quo, there's still a two, I've got to move things out of my screen. Um, there's still a uh, $2.7 million saving projection. Um, where, where, why would there be savings still under the status quo? Can you explain where that savings is coming from? So, yeah, so the, that savings is if you're at 85% and you accept the hydro, the large hydro, I think that's what you're referring to. It's we're accepting the large hydro. So it's a reduction in having to go in out and procure large hydro because you're accepting an allocation of the large hydro. Right. So basically, you're getting it at a at a cost without the at, at basically the cost of like a brown, brown energy, and you're getting the large hydro attribute on top for free. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Um. Okay. Well, I think that uh, like similar to other other comments today, um, you know, it seems that this this item needs a lot more discussion. I, for one, would really like to see. Um, this, you know, the, the $30 million uh, budget deficit, um, you know, better articulated um, yeah. and, and uh, explained, you know, what, what, how that's been approached and what are all the other cuts. That are I think similar to Monica's comments to really understand what the trade-off is here. Um, you know, I think like others in the community, I, I also, you know, representing, um, both, you know, kind of my own company and, you know, I think others in our industry, we would be very much opposed to um, introducing nuclear um, into the community choice uh, power mix here in Alameda County. Um, you know, so I think at this point, I would be in favor of uh, having more discussion on this item, um, really fleshing out uh, what are the other options for making up this, this deficit. Um, and, and definitely, you know, at, at a minimum on, on Wednesday, encouraging the board to move this to a discussion item rather than an action item um, in the near term so that, that the public and the board and the CAC can all, um, you know, have a chance to discuss this further with staff. Great. Thank you, Jane. Rick, do you have any comments? I don't. Thanks, Mary. I think everyone asked good right. questions. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Um, my one question uh, to, to Nick is timing. Um, I, I think that I, I do remember discussion of, of changing um, the power content coming up in previous meetings as, as one option uh, perhaps to, to take. Um, can you please explain the timing of this and what would occur, if anything, if uh, this item were not acted upon and therefore the other action item <laughs> may not be able to be acted upon if this were not in place in terms of nuclear, maybe they could be independent? Yes. So um, the timing is that we are um, uh, about 35% of our way through the calendar year. And, uh, you know, we have to make procurement decisions now for the rest of the year. And the longer we wait, so we, we had intended to bring this forward in March. Uh, that meeting was canceled. So we are bringing it forward here. Uh, the longer we wait uh, and not, and while not making an adjustment, Either we have to go and we lose the opportunity for savings because we go out and we buy more carbon free or we wait and then we, there's the risk that if we, if we don't, if the guidelines are not changed and we maintain the guidelines, then we have less time to fill our positions and we're susceptible to higher prices. So this is really a, a, a pretty timely item to be able to support um, you know, our procurement strategy for the rest of this calendar year. So that's the, that's the driver of the timeline um, 
as opposed to say waiting until June or July or August or, or, or what have you. The, the longer you wait, the less ability you have to um, adjust your procurement planning. And, and if we waited until May, would it, uh, if, if a decision were able to be made in May, would that, uh, I understand it's pushing out for procurement. Um, is that, I don't have a sense of whether or not waiting till May would, would really perhaps cause um, you to be susceptible to higher costs if you were to go um, have to procure this, if the choice was to keep the 85%. Yeah, you know, every, every pat thing, you know, it's a, it's a function of days, right? So if we wait another month, um, it's, we have 30 less days to go out and uh, implement the strategy that we, we are going to, uh, you know, have in place for ourselves. So, um, you know, it's not a, an answer that's like definitively yes or no. It's just that, you know, the longer we wait, the higher the risk is that we're susceptible to scarcity. Um, so that's, you know, unfortunately there's not a single answer of yes, we have to do it now or no, it's okay that we wait. Uh, you know, it's, there's a kind of a continuum. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I know for myself, what I've heard from, from the board are, uh, or from our committee, um, are simply some questions uh, around what this is and how this money would be used. Um, I think that amelioration of the deficit seems to be something that is positive, at least to me. I haven't heard anybody um, say that it's not good to reduce the deficit. Um, I think that there were, uh, Anne Olivia, I, I know that you asked uh, several questions um, around this and, and really wanted to separate this. Um, I think my, my comment is I, I do feel like some of this is being conflated between the two, and I think that they do go hand in hand. Um, I do feel that it is appropriate for staff to look for ways to save the budget. I mean, I think that's your job, is, is, to, is to ensure that we are a viable institution. Um, so I, I, I do think that this is, is one way and a positive step to save the budget. Um, however, what our um, task is as a CAC is to kind of provide advice to the board. Um, given what we just heard from Nick about the timing and um, the susceptibility to higher costs, um, if the procurement choice is not made, um, and some of these other things here, I guess I don't feel like I have a clear um, hearing from everybody, I, I can definitely pass on to the board that if possible, it seems like it would be better to push this off until an action in, in May. I know Cynthia, you definitely said that. Um, Anna Olivia, I think you said that as well. So I, as a CAC, what, what do you want to tell the board? I mean, I'd be willing um, to put forward a motion to, you know, a motion sure. to ask, the board to move this from a um, action item to a discussion item um, on Wednesday night to allow more time for public uh, comment and, and discussion. I, can we make some a friendly amendment to that or something? Yeah. And also, is it okay if we stop with the screen share on this particular slide so that we can see the participants' faces again? That'd be cool. No. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I, I think that uh, I would like it if um, Chair Sutter or Vice Chair Frank made a, uh, like these are the concerns that were raised. Um, it doesn't feel like an appropriate time to be making a decision, but absolutely provide the board guidance on the um, area issues of concern um, very Clearly, uh, this is recorded and live now, so we should be able to review it this evening. I would be happy to help you put that together. Um, and and I wanted to I wanted to get one more clarification, even if he doesn't answer it during this meeting. Uh, I would like Nick to. Sorry, we're in the middle of a motion, so I'll ask that at the end. Uh, but uh, so I I would 
say instead of just saying don't make a decision on this right now be due to the financial um, impetus uh, to clearly state these being the issues and the need for proper um, process in evaluating these things. Um, Mary, I, w I would like to add something if um, whenever I can come in. Yep. Um, what I would like to see also, uh, I don't know if it would be in this motion or not, I know that uh, Ms. French mentioned it, um, I would like to see uh, the staff provide some analysis on how the um, deficit could be reduced uh, without purchasing uh, nuclear en energy. Like I, I know there was some reference to, you know, slowing the the, the growth of the agency, uh, but you know, where could they possibly um, close close the deficit? Uh, if we didn't purchase uh, nuclear and energy, please. Great, thank you. It, it is outside of this motion. I, I think okay. that that is not this item, and so uh, I don't feel like we need to have it uh, put it here. And and I think as with all motions that we have, it it, it, it doesn't have to be exact wordsmithing. Um, but essentially, uh, Monica, do you have do you have specific concerns that you feel uh, need to be brought forward, or do you have another point? Yeah, I just had another point. I kind of lost track of what the motion was, but I think in addition to providing, um, I guess, areas of concern, we should also put forward perhaps things that we do support in the proposal. Like we support the concept of saving money to avoid having to raise rates um, or dip into reserves and not be able to get a credit rating in the future. Or we support the idea of, of having a um, a certain standard of RPS above PGDs. Maybe there's something that we can also provide for, put forward that's productive in helping the board when they're when they're looking at this, as opposed to what we don't like. Yeah, I would agree. All right. Those, so those right now, are friendly. I'll second it. All right. So, so we have a motion, a friendly amendment, a second friendly amendment, and a second you, on can that. Can you repeat the motion? I will. That can, I, I will. The, the motion, and again, I am not a big stickler on the words on the wordsmithing, but this is the this is exact or this is what I have down is that we will move that this item. Our recommendation is to move this item from an action item to an informational item during the Wednesday meeting, um, and these are the areas of concern raised. Um, and I need to get a couple of those in parentheses. I don't have those quite yet. Um, and there's a need for proper process in evaluating this issue. However, we do support the specific standard above RPS and, uh, and reducing the deficit. Mm -hmm. I, can I, well, it might be a separate thing, but like one other thing that's, you know, I don't know if we should discuss it is, you know, if, I think it's part of like looking at this, you know, the, the budget and where we can realize cost savings. Um, you know, and I just think it's it's premature to decide now whether giving up that 85% is is a decision we need to make until we actually see, you know, what's going on with the budget. Because you know, we could we could agree to these guidelines and then not take the allocation, and then, you know, we're you know essentially we'd have a, a dirtier mix, um, but we wouldn't be supporting. Uh, so how, you know, and again, it, it's without seeing the trade-offs and, and, and the budget, it's very, very difficult to have any kind of grounding or basis to say, you know, what would be better or worse. I, I have that, and I think that that is one of the areas of concern. Um, yeah. I would include it, it, it's not talked about that. So we have a motion on the floor, we have a second. Um, I would, unless there's um, additional discussion, I would like to call a vote so we can move on to our next item, which is also contentious. I, I do have a specific <laughs> request for staff's presentation of this item to, uh, to the board on Wednesday. I'd like to see a physical or at least written out what the power content labels would look like between the three um, products, because uh, it was said that if we, the, just because that is unclear in the presentation. And then at the end, um, CEO Chassett said that it would not all get dumped on um, 
bright choice. So if if it, it could be demonstrated in what the power content tables would look like, that would be really helpful. Um, also, um, I, I'll just I'll follow up with some questions. There's there's a you know, just so I, I'm clear about the, the request. So in the presentation, I think what we, we tried to demonstrate kind of a, a comparison power content between um, the, the power content guidelines, the status quo, and um, with and without nuclear, you would like us to also add in a comparison of Brilliant 100 where it would demonstrate, you know, the amount of allocation and the amount of nuclear? Well, no, um, so what, what was said in response to my question uh, about the allocation of nuclear power only to Bright Choice? was that it wouldn't all get dumped on the lower income or low cost uh, product that we offer. Um, and so since it did look like it was all going to end up in that rate class that, uh, or in that product offering, um, if you could demonstrate that this is what Bright Choice would look like and this is how it is shared with Brilliant 100, um, probably not the renewable because it doesn't qualify as a renewable. Um, so showing that it isn't um, just going on to uh, people who can't afford to opt up would be helpful because that was one of the concerns that was raised the last time it was heard at the board meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. I believe we actually we speak to that in the next presentation. So that I, yeah. I think that that question is addressed. Um, but this I don't Thank have to with that one. Okay. It's also just for um, a quick note in in the note on the slide five um, that Bright Choice is getting its pro rata share of the total EBC allocations, whether that's just hydro or hydro and nuclear, and the remainder of the total EBC allocations would go to Brilliant One Hundred. You're right that nothing would go to Renewable One Hundred because it's only renewable. Thank you. All right. One last time. I want to take a vote. <laughs> this motion. So all in favor of a motion where uh, I will bring forward to the board that the CAC advises that the board move this item from an action item to an informational item and that um, there, because there are areas of concern raised, an example being premature to reduce 85% when we don't know the other options available to us and there's a need for proper process in evaluating this issue. However, we do support specific standard above the RPS and reducing the deficit. All in favor? And uh, because I can't see everybody, can we have a, a, a voice? Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. That's what I will be presenting to the board on um, Wednesday. And we're going to move on to item C6. Um, this is the PG&E carbon free allocations. We had 50 minutes for this. We now have about a half an hour left in our meeting. Um, I, I'm going to kind of let things move forward, um, but ask that the staff kind of move through their presentation pretty quickly. I feel like the CAC has made itself pretty darn clear <laughs> in terms of whether or not they support the, the nuclear allocation or not. Um, but I think that one of the things that is really important that seemed to have come out new, and I hope that staff will spend some time on this, is that choices made this year may affect allocation options in subsequent years. So who's planning to uh, present on this to us? Who's presenting? Nick, are you presenting? Is Todd presenting? Alex is presenting. Is Alex, Alex? Presenting. If not, I can present. If you want to start it off. I've lost connection to the Zoom, so I can't see anything. So if you want to bear with me for a second. Alex is on as an attendee. If you want to promote him to panelists, that would probably fix it. 
I just promoted him to panelist. Alex, can you, are you on? Can you hear us? Alex should be rejoining us now. Okay. Hi everyone, can you hear me? This is Alex. Yes. Okay. Yes, thanks. Alex, we can. Go ahead. Yep. Great. Well, good evening. I, I realize that we've already discussed some of some of the subject matter, so I'll do my best to run through it as quickly as possible. Uh, that being the case, I think, Mary, unless you prefer otherwise, I can go straight to the next slide, or I can, or I can. I, I think, in, given our time, uh, I think that uh, the next slide, or even um, you know, highlights from item four. I think item slide five is interesting. And uh, and then get I think straight to some of the allocations would be okay. Well, the, the the second slide is, is or slide three is detailing the periods at which we've discussed this item before. I know everyone who's on this call has probably uh, been uh, participated in these previous meetings, but we wanted to lay out the the sequence of discussions that this item has received um, since since November of last year. Um, as far as the allocation process is concerned, I'd focus people's attention on period B, um, since that's going to more likely going to be the scenario in which um, the board would have to consider. Uh, are there any questions about about the allocation process that that we can help address? If not, we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So as far as what other CCAs and PGE service area have decided, here's a, a, a up to date summary of what has been decided. As you can see, um, several CCAs have accepted both the hydro and the nuclear portions of the allocation and some CCAs have decided only to accept the hydro, at least for this, this year. I know that some including MCE have kept the option open on nuclear for the future. Um, but this gives some, some important context that didn't exist before. Are there any questions about this? Okay, thank you. Nope. I have uh, just one question. In terms of load, is there a way to look at this, um, this same graph and uh, it, with an added column representing um, like either number of rate payers or total load? Uh, that would actually, that would be a challenge given that several, if not most of these CCAs are in the process of growing. Uh, I, I guess it would be possible if you were looking retrospectively, but that won't really be telling the full story. Um. Can I ask a, a question, Alex? It's on a basic Yes. yes. Um, Go for it, um, I don't see San Francisco clean, clean, clean power here. Did I miss it somewhere? Uh, no, and you know, I'm unless someone else has information on on their decision around this issue. Um, I'm not sure what Clean Power SF has decided to date. Okay. Not everybody's this is Nick. I do not. I'm not aware of their decision. I, it has not been reported yeah. to me, so I'm not. I actually don't know what they've done. Since no allocation has necessarily been offered, um, it doesn't mean that they won't make a decision. I guess. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, again, the, the process as we've discussed. And again, that, you know, the procurement floor decision is an, an important consideration because it presents a, a question of whether or not we're going to be comparing apples to apples when compared to PG&E 
or whether we should be just focusing on renewable as opposed to carbon free. Next slide, please. Tell us your question. Can you explain them just a little bit? Uh, the process? No, sorry, it just was, it was going very fast. Go to the next slide. Okay, the, the scenario in which EDCE would accept both the hydro and the nuclear portion of the carbon free allocation is, is as such. And again, we've, we've illustrated this in terms of whether or not the brook treatment floor is approved or not. What the savings are, et cetera. This is Nick. Let me just interject on on, on this particular point. I, I think that what what we're, we're illustrating here is that if the procurement floor uh, modification is is made, that um, you know the financial consequences of accepting or not accepting the nuclear allocation are. You know, significantly diminished because you're not going to, if you do not accept the nuclear allocation, then you're not going and replacing that nuclear allocation with procured large hydro. So th 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 that's the point is that if you, if you don't modify the procurement guidelines and you don't accept nuclear, you have to fill that 23.3% of your power mix with procured large hydro, which has um, you know, a projected cost of you know eight point six million dollars. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, because for the for the general public, and by that I mean folks who are out, outside of these meetings, they're not necessarily as um, as informed of the difference between carbon free and renewable, and it puts us at a it puts EDC and, and other CCAs at a disadvantage when when the focus is on carbon free, if nuclear is integrated within the carbon free category. Whereas with renewable, you can remove the, the, the nuclear uh, factor out of the equation and it's a much more fair comparison. But on this side, you hey, have hey, the Alex, price. Can, 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 Alex, can you move on to slide nine? I, I think slide seven and eight introduce numbers that have or six, seven, and eight, or at least seven and eight introduce numbers that are not as meaningful when as as when you compare options A and B. And slide nine and ten say if you choose item A and you accept it, you're going to get this. And then you have two other choices to make, and then okay. and tells the other one. And that's where the the bottom line numbers are starting to show up that it wasn't I went when I reviewed these it wasn't until I got to slide nine that I went oh I, I have no idea what that 2.7 and 8.6 was coming to because by the time you compare it they don't really show up so you might want to consider when you present this to the board on Wednesday kind of skipping over those if I understand it correctly and moving slow, you know to slide nine and then ten okay thank you for the feedback Mary and and I should say that even though you know, we're, we're discussing a, a portion of a year this year in 2020, this, this option will likely uh, return in the, in the coming years. So, which is why it's of value to look at this uh, on an annual basis or what the savings could be annually. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, go ahead, go ahead and, and I, I I know that my I know what my question is, but I think what I, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow of the presentation. And so perhaps you could continue with the presentation, and then we can get public comment, and then we can ask our questions. Thank sure. You. Well, if there are questions on this slide, I'm, I'm happy to move on because I know there are questions. We're hoping that the slides that she asked about in, in answer some of the questions. So we're just waiting for you. So 
sorry, on slide 10 or slide 9? Go, go ahead and start on 9. Okay, well, under, under option A, you can see that it, what the total procurement savings are, and you can see what the content is of nuclear, hydro, renewable, et cetera. And then option B. And this is Again, Vanessa. You know, well, Sorry, real quick. Oh, yes. Sorry, just, just to, to be clear, and hopefully this is clear that these are the same numbers that are presented in the, in the previous item. Yeah. Um, but looking, option A, Mary, you're right. Uh, those, those points are just strictly to uh, highlight what option A and option B entail in terms of what, how much of the allocation would, would be here. But, but the, the, the meat of the decision comes down to, um, comes down to these, these slides and looking at the comparison. Do you cover you. the power content for Brilliant 100 in this? And if they're not in the slides, can you please add them while you're presenting? The power content for Brilliant 100 is, is not included in here. Uh, it will remain 100% uh, carbon free, but um, there would be a, a nuclear percentage if that's what you're referring to. I'd, I'd just like to see it because you have it broken up for right choice. So. Right. Yeah, because there's more, there are more moving parts in the right choice, but uh, thank you for the fact. Yeah, you know, Olivia, that, 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 I mean, that, that's great because it really gets to the crux of the issue, is, which is, it, does carbon-free include nuclear or not? Now, are we going to be comparing a carbon-free power content or renewable power content? That's really the crux of the question, I think. So if, if we can okay, move on. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead and go to slide 10. Okay, so again, this is if the, if the power contact islands are not adjusted, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Perhaps you could explain it for the people on the phones, though, because not everyone can see the screen. Uh, would you like me to read the slide? I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to get to the, the people's questions as fast as possible. Mary, which, what would, would you prefer? Um, I, I tell you what, I'll just do a real quick summary. Um, slide 10 describes uh, the option A and B of including nuclear and hydro or not, and whether or not uh, the choice was made. Um, in slide 10, the choice has been made supposedly or perhaps by the board to not adjust power content. So you state 85%. The total procurement savings, if you include nuclear, is 10.2 million. If you do not include nuclear, 3.2. The difference being, if you go back one more slide, if you go back to the previous slide where the, the board has chosen to reduce the power content, the savings are 12.9 if you include nuclear and 11.8 if you do not. So I think the important point there is that 11.8 is very close to 11.3 and there's no nuclear. And that's only if they take the rate choice or the, the change um, that we were talking about just previously. So it ranges from 3.2 to 12.9 million between the two choices that they have to make. Um, do I have that right, Alex? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know that uh, folks on the phone, um, I, I would like to kind of, the one thing I would like to hear, because I think people will ask this, is the choice appears to have been made somewhere along the lines. And um, that, that this particular item also says if they make this choice now for the allocation, it will stay in place in the future. And my question for you is whether or not this, um, resolution has been stated because we don't have it in the in the presentation and does that resolution indicate that the choice will be made here and be the same in future years 
So if staff could answer that, and then I'd like to open it up to the public. Yes, we are making the decision around accepting the allocation for this year, and um, the, the resolution would, you know, keep that allocation decision in place through the term of the allocation. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephanie, Adrian, do we have um, public comment on this one? I think you said that we do have a few folks. And for those in the public, um, if you can keep some of your discussions short, then we'll get out of here closer to nine. If not, we'll just be here a little later. Totally up we have that. three speakers, Barbara Stebbins, Audrey Ichinose, and Desa Kabar. If they can please raise their hands. Great. Why don't you, uh, Barbara, are you available? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't see where to raise a hand anymore. I did before, but I don't now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the arguments, we have made arguments against accepting nuclear that is the most important to us, which really have to do with the fact that nuclear is dangerous, dirty, and has a long history of environmental racism as well. And so the idea that uh, the majority of any nuclear we took would then be foisted onto low income people is a real, uh, that is certainly a problem for us and the allied organizations that we work with. Um, there's a couple of things that, that I would really like to point out. If you look at the bottom of slide four, Look, look quick at the bottom of slide four. It says very clearly, if the board votes to accept nuclear on Wednesday, April 22nd, that staff will assume that that means they will accept nuclear in the years going forward. So it is a blank check to the staff to accept nuclear for all the years going forward. The, the other thing I'd like to point out is that at least in um, uh, the CEO's report, it does mention that the savings mentioned here would be half for 2020 because half of the year has expired. So I realized it was an answer that compared fiscal year with calendar year, but the allotment that was originally in the advice letter expires on December 31st. So we would get at most probably June through December for this year. So I'll just make those two points. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, who's, who's, our, uh, who's the next speaker? Do we have Audrey? Is that who you said, Jesse? Yes. yes. Uh, this is Audrey. Um, Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I hadn't submitted a speaker card for this, but since you called on me, I will say that um, I am preparing a, um, a comment uh, that I will ha uh, ask the, um, the clerk uh, to circulate to the board members as well as staff and maybe CAC members. And that concerns um, uh, early closure of Diablo Canyon. And my, uh, I concentrate on the financial aspect of it. And I uh, want to make a case that I think um, staff is uh, uh, unnecessarily pessimistic about the chances of uh, having, uh, getting uh, an earlier closure of Diablo. And um, so, you know, that would really uh, help us uh, a whole lot. CIA and the budget uh, deficit. Um, so please um, uh, look out for this statement that I'm going to have circulated. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Audrey. So, Stephanie or Adria, do we actually have another speaker? And so who? We have Jessica on mute for now. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, okay, great. Um, yes, so East Bay Clean Power Alliance submitted a letter today, uh, an amended letter that included I, um, about 60 or so organizations 
that are part of the East Bay Clean Power Alliance. In addition, we have a petition with about, I think the last time I looked was like 372 um, signatures from folks uh, that are against nuclear energy in East Bay Community Energy and support um, the closure of Diablo Canyon, the last nuclear power plant in California, no noting that San Onofre is currently in decommissioning because of a leak and concerns um, around seismic and safety issues. Um, it's time to put nuclear to rest. We should have learned from our mistakes of bad energy choices. We established East Bay Community Energy and a commitment to local clean energy because we know that the clean energy future that we need needs to be solar, wind, battery storage, and all the different programs that make up the local development business plan. It's time that we transition and, and really make this Green New Deal happen in our local community uh, and not repeat the bad choices and, and environmental disaster, disastrous um, decisions that have brought us to this point where we're at. Let me just remind folks that pandemics are the, res are the result of ecological collapse that we have contributed to, okay? In addition, climate catastrophe that we are also inundated with, wildfires, the pollution, there's so much more that, that is at stake. Now is the time to put an end to these bad decisions, energy decisions. Let pg e stay with it. They can't meet their RPS, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Oh, well, it's time for us to show them that we're cleaner and that we can do better. That's all. Thank you, Jessica. Do we have any other speakers? No, there are no more speakers. No? Oh, wait, I, okay. filled out, I filled out a card. This is Al. Oh, hi, Al. Go ahead. And that's the A. Sorry about that. Audrey got in for yours. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Go, Al. Um, yeah, thank you a lot. Uh, you know, uh, you all did see the fact sheet that the Stay Clean Power Alliance put out, largely to clarify uh, a, a lot of misinformation that was being provided uh, to the board and to us about what this offer was really about something that continues to, to confuse people between whether the energy is free or the allocation is free or push forward the notion that because of the high PCIA, people have essentially already paid for the nuclear and that's why it's free. These are all really, really, uh, you know, deceptive kinds of presentations. I want to mostly talk about why uh, PG&E uh, wants to make sure that they dump their nuclear power on community choice programs because this is something that hasn't been talked about at all. We all know that because of the departing load of community choice programs from PG&E that it has to sell all its nuclear power to its own customers, you know, the bundled customers. That percentage of power of nuclear in their portfolio is already, I think, somewhere around 40%. It's going to continue to increase as people leave to go to more community choice programs. PG&E is suddenly saddled with uh, 50, 60, 70 percent of its power coming from only one place, which is already a very shaky situation. But secondly, it would be then forced to sell all that uh, power that uh, if it wanted to keep, uh, you know, keep its nuclear power content lower uh, out on the open market and there is no real market for that community choice except in other states and whatnot. Basically, we know that PG&E has about a billion dollars a year currently and above market costs for that energy that's only guaranteed because it's able to sell that energy uh, in California to its own customers. And what this offer is all about is really dumping that excess nuclear power onto community choice customers so it can continue uh, to reap the profits from this very highly overpriced uh, energy production. So essentially what we do 
by taking this power as we continue being uh, captured by these huge PCIA costs, which PG&E pushed down on us and the other utilities, uh, and by uh, bailing out PG&E uh, for a very difficult situation that it would have if it had to saddle all its own customers with its nuclear power production. So essentially, we are the losers. PG&E is the big gainers. And all of this is pushed on us by PG&E, who has been very unsympathetic and hostile to the success of community choice. Thank you, Al. All right, I want to open it up to the CAC. Any comments from folks? I, I will remind everybody that we did recommend that no nuclear be accepted. Gosh, I think it was in February. I have to go back. <laughs> it was in January or February, but the CAC did recommend that. We had some other uh, discussions, but we, we did make that recommendation in the past. So, it was January. Uh, I don't see any hands. Okay, Anne Olivia and then Monica. I just, um, and Jane. We submitted uh, questions to staff, uh, and I had prepared them from the January responses. Uh, I presented them orally in February. Staff requested that I put them in writing so that um, they could respond in writing, and then uh, we reminded them again last week. Uh, they were in February. We do recognize that this month has been totally bonkers and that everyone is trying to function in a highly stressful situation at home and professionally. But it was two months ago. Um, and so uh, I was supposed to get those responses as was the rest of the CAC and the public. Um, and then they weren't prepared in writing. And then I was told that they would be gone through. It is 8.57. Um, and they were supposed to be answered in this meeting. Those were, those were questions compiled from the entirety of the CAC. They were technical. Um, they addressed the concerns that are being brought up by the community and the board. Uh, and I would like to know where those answers are because that is information. Like we are a panel of experts. We are supposed to inform our board about areas that they should be considering. And I, I guess I just would like to know where those answers are and if they could be covered now. Thank you, Anna Olivia. You know, I, I think the the uh, information we provide in the presentation, I, from our perspective, kind of covers the information that we can you know provide at this point. Um, we did answer uh, at our February board meeting. Uh, there was an extensive sort of discussion of a lot of very specific questions. So I think the information we presented previously and, and today is the information that we feel we're able to present um, on this topic at this time. They're very specific questions. And, um, and even, what was it, yesterday or the day before, we were told that they would be answered in this meeting. The, the questions that I have, well, some of them have been mm, alluded to, they have not been answered or addressed and definitely not directly. I, I think there might have been a miscommunication uh, earlier this week about what would be presented tonight. I think what we've been presented tonight um, it is, is sort of what we were, we're able to present on the topic. Um, you know, if there's anything that hasn't been covered in this presentation that specifically uh, or hasn't been covered previously, certainly we can answer those questions that you may have, but. Um, yes, absolutely. I can forward them again to you now if you, are, if you would like. Sure, a ask the questions now. We'll, Todd or myself can uh, help try to answer any questions that remain unanswered. Okay, Jerry. You're gonna try and field those verbally at this time? Like you don't have answers I, um, I, I, I don't know what I, I'm not sure which questions that are remain unanswered at this point. So uh, sure. which questions are have not been answered or, or uh, not there, been there are there are several. Let me pull them up. I was uh, exact wording was requested. Um, so I will pull up the exact wording because it was very carefully worked on. Um,
the questions that were distributed uh, on February 19th. Um, so uh, the original question I submitted asked what the cost of the product was. Staff's response clarified a key element, incremental cost. I will skip the explanation there, but it is important. Um, uh, the answer did not answer the um, question directly. Um, the response indicated that there is an actual cost not covered by the PCIA, um, that the power itself is not free, just the carbon free attributes part is free. This um, indicates at least the cost parity to the cost of power purchased on the wholesale market um, or the cost of natural gas. Um, so is there a positive finite cost and non-zero cost for the power from Diablo Canyon and the hydropower allocation even? Um, and we understand that there's not an incremental cost, even if that requires purchasing that power, the nuclear that is just put into the KISO grid and then we purchase that power from the KISO grid. What, what is there a non-zero sum cost? Todd, would you like to answer? Yeah, I'll take a shot at it. Hey, Anna Olivia. Uh, I, I think the answer is no. There, there's there are a bunch of different costs being tossed around. So there's the cost of Diablo, which is recovered through the PCIA, PCIA eligible resource. That cost is offset by a variety of other either revenue sources or imputed valuations. Um, with respect to this particular power. As Nick said earlier, all of all of the power PG is selling is sunk to the Cal ISO. All the power that we're taking out is purchased from the Cal ISO. So, so all the costs from pg es perspective are either recovered through the PCIA or from the Cal ISO. Um, I mean, that's so. That's, I, I think that the simple answer is there is no cost to EBCE of this power because the costs are so, covered through Cal ISO or the PCIA. So, but the PCIA uh, captures the cost above the market value um, of creating it. So oh. the capture, the power, the cost, this is very much why I wanted, uh, why I supported staff's recommendation that this be done in writing with time to evaluate, um, uh, especially if we're going with exec words. Um, so, the PCA captures the everything but the cost of the power. It's the itself because um, it's all the extra costs above market costs that are captured inside of that PCIA. Um, I do hear that we have to purchase the power from the grid, but we're getting that. that, that wait, wait, wait. Let me pause for a second. Back up. The PCA captures all the costs. Period. Full stop. Okay. Mm -hmm. but what I, what you're calling costs are actually credits that offset the cost. So, so when PG&E gets money out of the market, that's offsetting the cost. There's a PCIA rate. The PCIA rate is just the above market cost. The PCIA rate is set after you do that netting of the, of the revenues or the imputed values from the cost. So there's, there's a PCIA rate that's different than the PCIA costs. So the costs include everything, right? All, you know, whatever it is they spend on Diablo, Apart from like decommissioning, but but for the actual operation of the thing, the capital cost, so all of that gets dropped into the PCIA bucket. All of the costs, there's an offset, and that results in the PCIA rate. So the rate is just the above market, right? But the costs are all going into the into the, the PCIA bucket at the front end. So in terms of kind of getting the the semantics clear here, the the rate is the above market piece. <laughs> okay, um, I will examine that wording as carefully as I can later. Uh, just to kind of run through as much as I can, the MCE's technical committee item on GHG uh, free allocation in February um, uh, outlined a couple issues that um, their staff identified as, um, as potential issues, and I just wanted to know what our staff thought about these things. Um, and uh, it, the, the quote is, unlike the interim proposal, allocations not accepted by an LSE under the PCIA proposal would be reallocated automatically among LSEs participating 
um, in the allocation of that and of category or resources and not simply return to the IOU. Allocations would continue for as long as the underlying assets are in the PCIA mechanism, but LSEs could opt in or out each year by a certain deadline. That does sound like, at least without direct board action, that that would not happen. Uh, but attributes would be tradable or available for sale after received by an LSC with no further involvement of the IOU. Um, the next section, uncertainty in the market. Um, I, I just wanted to get y'all's take on those things because those felt like really important issues, especially when we know that certain um, CCAs have not accepted the allocation. And so what would you, like the original amount that would said to be allotted to us, it would be greater if that moves forward but we don't actually even have the final proposal yet, do we? Do we know what our allocation would be? Uh, no, we won't, we won't know what the allocation is until they actually make it, which will be sometime after the PUC votes out the advice letter on the 7th. Um, I, I can step through at least the first part of, of what you were, I think, quoting from MCE, if you want me to tell you about that. Sure. Um, so, so what that's referring to, that's, that's doing a comparison between the interim allocation methodology, which is what's in the advice letter, mm -hmm. and a proposal that was made jointly by CalTCA, Southern California Edison, and um, Commercial Energy, which is a ESP direct access provider, in the PCA proceeding working group three. So the reason this methodology is called the interim methodology is because it's supposed to be superseded by whatever comes out of this working group three process. And, and what, what MC's paper there is talking about is the differences between, one of the differences between the allocation methodology that was proposed by that group in working group three and the interim methodology. And the specific difference that they were talking about is, is what happens with chunks of, of allocation that, that offerees decline. So if somebody says, no, I don't want my allocation, what happens to that slug of GHG free? And, and there is a difference between what emerged from the working group three um, process and, and is in that, that joint proposal and what's here in the interim proposal. Uh, and the difference specifically is that, is that in working group three, um, if folks turn down an allocation, it gets split up and divvied up again amongst those who accepted it, whereas in the interim allocation, it just goes back to PG. So that's what, that's what that's talking about. And that's, you know, that's, that's a point that we kind of said, all right, fine, um, just to move things forward. And that's part of why we've been very clear that what's happening here is non-precedential with respect to what comes out of working group three. You know, there's some differences. Um, it just means there's kind of less to go around um, with the interim proposal than, than with the uh, working group three proposal. On the plus side, it means that if you don't take nuke, you won't end up with nuke being reoffered to you again, um, which is kind of what happened with the working group three proposal. So that's that's what that's talking about. I do I do understand what it is. I was I was wondering your take on it. Um, is it possible for a staff member to go through some of these things? so that I can provide an analysis, especially when I'm looking at kind of the discrepancies between here and the information that um, I gathered, uh, but would want to sit down. Um, I actually tend to be more conservative on these things. I wanna make sure that the numbers that I'm looking at either don't align or that I understand where the calculations are going differently. Is there a way that I could speak with a staff tomorrow to make sure I understand this prior to the board meeting? Yes, absolutely. We'll set you up. Todd or Alex will follow up to schedule something. Which, Great. Thank you. Which, which numbers are you concerned with, Anne Olivia? I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the right person necessarily. Um, there's, there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I submitted a full document. I narrowed it down to three pages um, and that included explanation so that the public would understand what it was that was being asked. Um, and it's been two months. Um, these are important things to be looking at in order to appropriately inform the board 
and um, I was informed again that we would go through these things during this meeting and I don't feel equipped to make a really um, thoughtful and a thorough analysis for me to say like, okay, I feel good about this. So I will go through it. Um, I will stay up tonight if necessary uh, or take a time out of my workday tomorrow um, and make sure that the things that I'm asking of your time are um, thought out and, um, and thoughtful. So I can include y'all on the email and um, whoever is appropriate can respond. I, I think that, um, uh, well, perhaps what we can do is uh, at the end of this meeting or early tomorrow, um, you can set up a, a call with Anna Olivia and Todd. You and Alex can both be on it. Uh, Anna Olivia and, and can present her questions to either of you. Um, yeah. I, I will say that I feel that the item being presented today is subs like substantively distinct from the items that have been presented since November, not only in the ongoing nature of it, but um, in, in a variety of areas, uh, there is still great uncertainty about what the actual details of what are is being asked to be voted on. Um, and if they're gonna decide it on the 7th, then we should revisit this after that when there is adequate time to provide the information and the answers, as well as the actual proposal that we would be voting on, especially as this is so distinct from what has been said repeatedly in the past to the public and the board. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Are there anything else Should we move on? Sounds like you muted yourself. Okay, um, Monica? Monica? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I had a question, Mary, and then just make a couple of comments. So you said that the CEC recommended to the board that we CAC. not, um, yeah, the CAC recommended to the board that we not accept the nuclear allocation, but I don't remember we actually took action. I thought we had a lot of discussion, but we didn't actually take an action. I went through the minutes to see when the action was taken, and I can't seem to find that. It was in the same meeting um, where we had some nuclear advocates come talk, and I remember we went round and round, but we did not we did not make a formal action on that, did we? I think we did, um, uh, yeah. Monica, because I recall make making. The I just went through the I just went through the minutes of the February meeting and the January meeting, and there's no reported right. action. In fact, it says no action taken. You may want to go back and relook at that because I don't think it's a accurate statement that we said we should decline the nuclear. In fact, I remember specifically saying that I'm not in a position right now to decline that. And so we had, a, we had this convoluted of motion, I thought, that talked about all, all kinds of stuff, but we didn't actually take an action. So just that's one point. Um, my second point is on the question of the 2020 alloc interim allocation versus the authority, I'm sorry, somebody trying to say something? Oh, versus the authority that uh, staff is asking for longer term allocations. And um, I guess I'm a little bit uh, concerned or just wanna make sure that I understand that since the, the longer term allocations, that proposal and what that's gonna be is still very much in flux right now. In fact, PG&E uh, threw in a kind of a, a red herring into that whole discussion about what can be allocated and not be allocated and, and suggested even that if the allocations were to happen, that if you accepted the large hydro and you accepted the nuclear, then you also had to accept natural gas. So my, my question or my comment or my concern is, that if staff is given kind of an automatic, um, the board gives them an automatic, but if they approve this interim allocation that it, that it then goes on to longer term, that there be some mechanism for staff to come back and say, hey, the, the, the uh, nature of what is being presented to us longer term is much different than what the interim allocation was, either because there's this reallocation of nuclear should some of the CCAs reject it, or there's this imposition of having to take fossil fuel um, if you wanted to take the nuclear and the hydro. 
So that's one suggestion I would make. And then um, I'm still not clear, and I've read the staff report a couple of times, if, if staff is actually asking us to make a decision tonight. I see that there's two off proposals being made, the proposal A and proposal B, but is there a, is there a request that we accept one or the other tonight? So our, our choice is to advise the board perhaps on one of these options and they're planning to vote on it on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. They're planning to vote on, on an allocation on, on if they're going to take hydro, if they're going to take nuclear and, and under the assumption that their choice that they made on Wednesday will be the choice in the future. And staff, if I have that wrong, please correct me. That's, that's that is correct. correct. Staff is looking. It's, staff is presenting two options for the board. One uh, option A is to accept the hydro and the nuclear allocation. Option B is to accept only the hydro allocation. That is the. Those are the. That's the decision point for the board. And along with that, Nick, is that, and this would be this would carry over to the longer term allocations as well. And so the staff, in. E e e e the staff recommendation would be to then not require the staff come back to seek further acceptance of the allocation. I, I think the point you make, though, about material changes to the allocation process is something that uh, um, was not uh, is, is relevant here and, and is a point taken to sort of integrate into the staff presentation on Wednesday. And then maybe if somebody can actually confirm the statement that we voted to not accept it, I'd like to know when we did I can. that. It is. It, it was the December meeting. Um, it was, yes. uh, we provided this information to the board on Wednesday, December 18th. So this was our December 16th meeting. And I can tell you the exact wording because this was one where we actually did spend some time. It says the CAC advises the board to reject nuclear allocations and also to seek clarification on several issues prior to making any choice. Specifically, the CAC has the following questions that would be beneficial for the board to explore. These questions cover risks, powers, and power content. Okay. So not everybody supported that. Uh, well, so we, uh, that was what we had, December 16th. Yeah, so I guess just so that I don't have to come back and speak, um, as convoluted as this process is, I can, I, can, I can guarantee you that it's not as bad. What they're presenting here is only a tip of the iceberg of how confusing this is, having to deal with this myself and my own and my own CCA that I work for. It's a very complicated issue and they're tough decisions. It's a decision about saving money by avoiding paying for carbon-free resources versus changing rates and deferring programs and possibly even laying off staff. So those are tough decisions. And the reality is that the nuclear is going to flow. Anything we do here tonight is not gonna change whether the nuclear flows or not. If there, for some reason the CPC decides to decommission uh, Diablo earlier, well then we just won't get the allocations. It's, it's not like we're gonna stop the decommissioning of a, of a nuclear plant. So if it was put to a vote tonight, I would be in favor of option A, I think taking both nuclear and the hydro with the purpose of saving the money, real money savings to the rate payers of EPC. Okay, Jane, do you have any comments? Uh, I don't really have much to add. I, I think from my perspective, I would be in favor of option B um, because I think it was the, the, some of the public comment pointed to, I, I just feel fun, you know, having nuclear in our mix is just not, you know, why this project, you know, this whole endeavor was, um, embarked upon or, you know, the, the kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of understanding um, that the community had in, in kind of, uh, you know, putting forward, you know, EVCE to begin with. Um, and I think that the, the, the harm and the harm of nuclear um, and kind of perpetuating that energy on the 
the grid in any way whatsoever is just, you know, it's, it's just uh, far outweighs any benefit um, that I'm seeing at this point. And again, you know, I mean, I think there's obviously, I think I, I'm not disagreeing with Monica about the larger um, uh, context around, you know, budgetary uh, requirements and, and um, trade-offs, but I just don't see that information presented to us in a way, in a, in a clear way that's making it, um, a, uh, a irrefutable argument that we, that we must take this now. Um, and I also uh, am really not comfortable with um, authorizing, uh, you know, with, with a decision that, you know, with authorizing a kind of a, a decision in perpetuity that, you know, would not be brought back and discussed again, particularly as when this was initially brought forth, it was brought forth as a, as a one-time deal. Um, Cynthia, yeah, just a second, Anne Olivia. Cynthia, I, I had heard uh, from you previously, um, and I put it down that you're not in favor, uh, and you're, you remain opposed to inclusion of nuclear in all allocations. Uh, are, do you have any other um, comments well, or thoughts um, that you'd like to make at this point? Yeah, I, I was wondering um, whether this item on uh, the Wednesday meeting, the Wednesday JPA meeting, um, I remain, you know, against nuclear and en energy uh, for the same reasons that Ms. French just said. Uh, I just think it goes against the, the vision uh, of um, community choice. And also, we could we could lose customers. I mean, there there is, a, you know, I, I don't want to say this. Uh, there is an element of uh, deception here. Well, from my point of view, uh, um, you know, when uh, they they were kind of bringing in nuclear energy when initially we were, I, I thought as a group, uh, op opposed to it, uh, along with coal. Uh, but that being said, I wonder if this item uh, should be an informational item on Wednesday's meeting um, as well. I don't know if. You have any thoughts on on that, um, or should we just? I, I'm going to put that to staff. My assumption is it's the same. Uh, I, I don't know about the timing um, of this, but my assumption is it has the same timeline as what we discussed in the previous one. That's about that's exactly my my thinking. And but, I, go ahead. Well, I, I guess I I I'll ask staff is is the timing any different for this one than the previous one? previous item. Nick, you're on mute, if so. Yes, yes, our expectation is that we do need to provide an indication to the CPUC and PG&E of what we want to do in regards to the allocation in May. And um, we may, if we wait until the May meeting, we may miss our ability to make uh, make an make a determination to accept one or both allocations. So, so yes, we do need to vote on it. Okay. Um, I wonder if um, a motion is in order to uh, accept uh, option B. Uh, Anne Olivia and and then Cynthia, I'd like to come back to you to see okay. uh, Anne Olivia That's does fine. have have one more thing, and then I'd like to come back because I would like a motion on the floor so we can uh, close this. Anne Olivia, uh, you um, Nick, you said that the uh, what the actual decision, what the real offer was going to be, was going to be decided at May seventh. That is our expectation that the PUC will make a determination on uh, the allocate the advice letter or resolution uh, at the May meeting. Todd, if I'm if I'm wrong, please step in though. No, that's right. That sounded bonkers. Um, so the so our normal um, our normally scheduled uh, first meeting of the month, which we often skip is May is uh, May 6th. Um, if that meeting is, that information won't be um, 
public by then because they have to work it out on the 7th, right? Uh, we do not have a regularly scheduled meeting uh, for May 6th. We, we, and Stephanie, step in if that's not correct, but I believe we, have, uh, we are no longer scheduling regularly scheduled meetings for the first Wednesday of the month this year. That is correct. We are just scheduling the regular third meeting of the month. The third Wednesday of the month. Hmm. Uh, well, it's, it's possible that we might need to hold an additional meeting or something um, to go over this, but it, it really feels like we should know what that determination is before we vote on it. Because when you said um, that you could bring it back if something was substantially different, it's substantially different from what? From the thing that we don't know yet? Or the thing that they decide? What if the, you know? I, I, I guess I'm still confused as to why we're doing this before an actual proposal is uh, or offer is on the table. Hey, Nick, can you uh, remind us how much time the uh, LSEs have after the CPUC makes their decision to let PG&E know their choice? Todd, will you refresh me on those specifics? Um, so there's a a certain lag, probably a couple of days between the PG making the allocation and then 30 days from the allocation to accept or decline. <coughs> Todd, you're kind of muffled. I, I, I heard that there's an uncertain lag, but then I didn't I didn't get a sense of if that's a day or two, a week or two, a month or two. But from what we heard from PG E, they're willing to make the allocation, you know, basically right on the heels of the meeting. That would mean a day or two later. For the terms of the advice, it would be a 30 day window, which to accept the allocation once it's, once it's made. PGE has stated that formally that they're willing to start making, making the deliveries as quickly as we can accept or decline and allocate, make deliveries in, in the case of accepting. Um, they would make deliveries as soon as we accepted. They wouldn't, they wouldn't wait out for 30 days. But we have 30 days to accept it. Yeah, but we don't days. want to take the 30 days. Yeah, but you don't have to take it. And if you do, you're, you're, you want to accept, you've lost you know, whatever the gap was there. Yeah, most of us, most of us um, have been preparing in advance of the decision. So as soon as the decision happens, we can turn around and make that confirmation with pg &E so we can start delivering like within two or three days. Because every day that we delay is a day that we have to buy carbon-free resources for it. And we don't, get to, we don't get to materialize those savings. So we want to be able to execute this as soon as the decision goes away. Um, okay, so I'd like to come back to Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, I think that you were, you were starting uh, to make a motion. Um, yeah. Do you still want to put that forward? Uh, yes, if it doesn't complicate anything. Um, I would like um, to move to accept um, option, uh, the PG&E offer uh, plan, uh, op option B rather. Okay. Um, I, I have a friendly amendment to that, if you're willing. Sure. Um, I, I would also like to put on to there that um, staff, that, that we recommend that staff come back to the board uh, for future allocations um, if there are differences uh, between what is being allocated now and what is being allocated in the future. Absolutely. I still feel like we need to say something about this, not, I don't like voting on it before we have a concrete offer. I will not block it, I'll support you in it. Okay, thank you, Ann Olivia. Um, I'm writing here and then I wanna come back and ask everybody a question. Um, So the, the motion at this point as, as put forward and amended, amended is that the, the CAC 
would advise the board to accept option B of the allocations, and also which is uh, hydro only, no nuclear, and also that staff come back to the board for future allocations if there are material differences between the current allocation and future allocations. And my question to staff is, is the term material differences sufficient to really highlight what we're trying to say? Or can you think of other words that um, really help show what we mean? Todd, you're the lawyer. Are material differences, an, is that an okay term? Or is there a more precise term that would be beneficial to I'm use not, in our motion? I'm not your lawyer. Um, <laughs> True. I, I, can, I, can, I can say that I think we get the gist of it, right? All right. That's all I needed to know. The changes you want, you want us to come back. Okay. That's right. So we have a motion on the floor and an amendment. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Monica? Okay. So we have four in favor. Any abstentions? And Rick has dropped off, so he's no longer able to. Uh, Okay, uh, I'm gonna close this item. We are coming up on 9.30. Uh, item C7 is any member or staff announcements, uh, including anything that we want to place on future CAC agendas. And Olivia? I really wanna recognize the incredibly hard work of um, staff and leadership in the COVID-19 response. The uh, community grants have been making a serious uh, and material difference in the lives of organizations working directly with communities who are being impacted in ways that we have previously unfathomed. I just really wanna say thank you and uh, express deep gratitude for the work that you're doing right now. Second that. Any other announcements? Nope. We will adjourn to May 18th, Monday, May 18th. And uh, at this Thank point, you all uh, very much. we will be in touch in terms of whether or not it will be virtual or in person. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.